Morning, everybody. Um, before we start, I just need to apologize for my voice. Um, somebody needed to finish the beer last night. And a uh, <laughs> um, little bit croaky. It's getting better, actually. But uh, yeah, it's a little bit on the croaky side. So, uh, that, but it, thankfully, I've got a microphone, so that's uh, helping. Um, how to make your DBA happy. Um, just very quickly, how many of you are DBAs? Okay, great. So you can just listen. Um, and all the rest of you need to actually take action afterwards. <laughs> but um, no, it's well, probably need to take action. Let's let's we we'll, 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 you can we can make judgment at the end. There we go. Um, but before we get to that, um, me uh, James Palmer. I've been in the open edge world for more than twenty years. Um, started work as a developer, then did some work as a DBA. Um, Still do DBA work, but I'm more recently working as an architect and managing a team of uh, 11 developers um, in, our, in our organization. And um, that has some interesting challenges, uh, particularly being in both development and architecture and DBA camps. And I think it gives quite a unique perspective on how it all hangs together and uh, um, who's to blame for things. <laughs> It's not that we point the finger at all. No, it's never never anybody's fault. But uh, yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah. So uh, we've got a very simple agenda. Um, I'll put the agenda up in a minute. But before we say anything else, if you've got questions, just interrupt me. Um, that's fine. Um, there will be hopefully time for some questions at the end as well. But if you if there's anything you want to ask, then just stick your hand up and we'll we'll get to it. And uh, if that means we miss some stuff off the end, then it probably is more beneficial to talk about what's actually. Uh, what's, what's, what you're struggling with, with uh, what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, so very simple agenda. Um, just stop developing. There we go. We can all go home. Uh, um, but seriously, um, I'm going to talk about, first of all, why or what motivated me to write to pr propose this talk, essentially using an example uh, um, from where I work now at Virtue Motors. Um, so we're a, we sell, we're, we're an end user of Progress. We, it's an internal application. We sell cars. Um, we sell a lot of cars. We have 7,000 employees. Um, who knows how many customers? Uh, four and a half billion pounds of turnover last year. So um, that's you know it's, it's a busy busy database. Everything goes through the database, and we have performance problems. And uh, one specific one um, was quite a good example for uh, why this talk exists. Uh, and we'll talk about some general principles. And as I say, there'll be some space for questions at the end. So. Poor performance, it's the DBA's problem, right? <laughs> or maybe maybe it's infrastructure, particularly if you're in AWS or in Azure or something, you know, that's gotta be that's that's gotta be it. And actually that's it often is true. It, there there are things that can be done from a database perspective or an architecture perspective that can improve things and everything else. Um, but even with those problems that can be fixed by tuning the database or something else, a large por portion of the responsibility also lies with the developers and with the code that's running. Um, and at least three quarters of all the problems that I've dealt with over the last 18 months have at least uh, had something to do with code, if not, if not all to do with code. Um, but it's not the first place that people look, and um, uh, so that's where this sort of came from. And we had a, a, a specific example at the beginning of this year. Um, it took a while to fix, but... Um, the system would slow down every couple of hours, at all the odd hours of the day. So 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, the system would slow down for maybe 15 minutes or so. And uh, we, had, we managed to eliminate all external factors. Um, there's no virus scans, no backups running, no, uh, nothing like that. Um, the AWS monitoring was showing that everything was just perfectly happy. Um, but, and still the system slowed down. And at other times, everything was running just fine. Um, and eventually, we managed to work, well, eventually we worked out that it was coinciding with a batch process, although we had a number of batch processes that ran at that time, and pinpointing which one it was and what the actual problem was, was a lot harder than maybe you might think. Um, but what we saw, so this is, uh, we use ProTop um, for, for monitoring and so on. You can use other monitoring tools, that's not a problem, but what we saw um, is our app server queue um, at uh, these times. So you've got 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock. We were lucky that day at 1 o'clock, nothing there. Um, but down here, 3 o'clock, um, uh, we've got these spikes in the, in the queue. And those are, those are queued requests. 
So that means at this particular moment in time, 500 people are waiting for a web speed screen to come back to them. That's a lot of people waiting for a spinning, <laughs> spinning, spinning. Um, and sometimes it would go to a 503 service not available, um, and they'd have to refresh, and they'd get back into spinning, and eventually come back. Um, but that's, that's not good for the user. It's not good user experience at all. Um, so that's what, we, that's what we could see. That's the evidence that, uh, that's the, of, of what was going on, um, the symptoms, I suppose. Um, so we had to do some analysis. And uh, we noticed, after a long time, uh, looking at disk I.O., um, so this is, this is the actual database um, volume. That's where the database sits. And we were seeing it uh, just after 9 o'clock, just after 11 o'clock, just after 1 o'clock, just after 3 o'clock. We've got these spikes. So the way Protop does reads, the reads are going down the scale, and the, uh, the writes are going up the scale. So that's why it looks upside down. Um, so we've got these increases in reads at these, all of these point moments in time. And that was basically being replicated um, across every day. So we, we, it was a real struggle still to work out what it was, because if you look at, we looked at um, what was reading the, the database, and the OS reads, reads on the database were pretty much a flat line, very consistent across the board. And eventually we had to dig into um, individual tables. And actually you can see here, this is a stock table. Um, and you can see that there's these prolonged massive increases in OS reads. So an OS read is when the um, data is having to be pulled from the disk to the client, not from memory. So it's not been cached in memory on the database side. It's, being, it's having to be read from the disk. Um, and that's obviously an expensive operation. That's why we have a memory cache. Um, and we try and make the memory cache as big as possible, because reading it from memory is quicker than reading it from disk. Um, and so there we have our evidence. This is why it's happening. And uh, still, fixing it wasn't necessarily just as uh, all that easy. Um, well, we event eventually identified that there's a stock load process. So our, we have a we have a third party um, application that we interface with to do with, to do with stock, um, and we have to get every two hours we get that s a stock feed from them, which is all stock that we've ever touched, uh, and we have to check um, that that stock record hasn't changed um, since the last time we checked it two hours ago, because the third party system is flat files, it's horrible, and it has no rec it has no concept of change date, change time, or anything like that. So we have to check everything. And many records are not being updated. They're just historic stock. You know, they're, just, they're just sitting in the database. We maybe sold that vehicle 15 years ago. We don't really need to know about it anymore. Um, but we ha we're having to check it. And when this system was written, it was fine, because we only had maybe two, three 300,000 vehicles in stock, or in this historic stock. We've now got millions of vehicles in historic stock, and it's become a problem. Um, but because this is the only process that's reading stock, and then the historic stock, they get read into the, bu into the buffer cache at, to do this process. And then during the course of the two hours, they get flushed back out of the buffer cache. Two hours later, they get pulled back in again, and they get flushed back out again. Um, and <coughs> essentially, um, the process, what we had to do, we enhanced the process. We went to the business, and we said, look, it's ridiculous that we're having to check 15, 16, 20 years of stock every two hours, um, give us a cutoff date when we no longer are interested in those vehicles anymore. Um, and uh, so we were able to do some, put some logic in. Um, we also improved the uh, performance of the, the queries and so on, added some indexes. And, uh, um, and as you can see, we still get a spike. Every two hours, we get a spike of reads from the OS. We still have historic records we have to check. Um, but it's, we managed to improve the process, so it's only doing one scan of the database for those tables. Um, yes, Jim? Um, did we consider the alternative buffer pool? Yes, it's a good question. The trouble is the data is very dynamic and it's very big. Um, so it's, it was a decision that we made not to in the end because um, the, the alternative buffer pool, the advantages of the alternative buffer pool is that it, it, it always stays in memory. Um, once it's gone into memory, it stays in memory. Um, and you're not latching that data to read it anymore because it's in memory. Um, and it's a good question. But um, because we're already using the alternative buffer pool for other things, um, we didn't really want to put the whole stock table into it. It's a good question, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that may be a solution that we could have used. 
Um, and it may be a solution that we have to revisit because we've got other problems <laughs> now anyway, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, but you can see we've still got those spikes every two hours, but it's not impacting the performance of the system anymore because it's not long drawn out reads. Um, it's just a one-off reading everything or reading the records. Um, but what about the cost? Well, we had slowdowns across the business, 7,000 employees sitting there with spinning web, web speed screens. Um, we had hours of crisis calls, senior management, the CTO was involved, um, and you know he's got better things to do with his time than trying to work out what's going on with the, with the application, but it got to quite a crisis point. Um, hours of analysis from other people, it's got to be infrastructure, it's got to be infrastructure, it's got to be the deep database. And it was actually a complex development task as well to actually fix it because the code is legacy code, it's not been touched for a long time, we had to make sure that it didn't break anything. So it was a very expensive um, process, and I suppose if, it, if only it had been done right the first time, you know, in retro <laughs> hindsight, we could say that very easily. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's um, that was our, uh, our the example, and I thought, well, this has got you know we're not unique here. I've seen this sort of thing many times before in other in other jobs, in other places, in other applications. So hence the motivation. So let's have some general principles, and the first one is to do it right, and to do it right now. Um, just because something's been done in a particular way for decades doesn't mean it's the right way to do things. Um, you know, we could have had um, changes in best practice, changes in progress versions, so there's new, new functionality. Um, someone might have done it wrong in the first place. Um, you know, it's very easy to take a piece of code and think, oh, that does what I want it to do, copy, paste. Um, and, you know, there we go. Um, that's just increasing the technical debt because now there's two places that you've got to maintain that broken code. Um, if you can create reusable code, maybe it's one, one place to fix it. And if you want to learn about how to create great reusable code, then the consulting work team are sitting over there and they know all about object-oriented stuff, I'm sure. Um, but uh, and there's plenty of other people as well, just picking on them for fun. Um, and it makes it harder to move forward if we just don't do it right straight away. Um, you know, one of, as I said, you know, we wished we'd done it right 15 years ago. Um, would have saved a lot of heartache and problems. And if you're not fixing old stuff, at least make sure the stuff you're adding, the new stuff you're writing is correct. Um, even if you're leaving the legacy debt in there, at least write the new stuff right. So code quality, um, it's, it's a big one. And there's a few things that you can, that you can do in terms of code quality. Um, and some of, these are, some of these are maybe not making the DBA happy necessarily, but it's, you know, having good code makes the DBA happy, so you know, there's, there's less, less, less problems. <laughs> so don't use a release statement. Um, there's, I don't think, there's very few reasons why you would want to use the release statement. And if you see the release statement in code, and it's not documented as to why it's been used, then there's a good chance that the developer is expecting it to do something different to what it actually does. So people will use release because they think that it ends a transaction and releases the buffer and releases the lock um, and everything else. It doesn't. Release, all that release says to the client is, I don't want this buffer anymore. I'm not going to use it anymore. The record still remains locked until the transaction scope finishes. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't actually do what you think. But people, but for legacy reasons, I, you see it everywhere. It release this record, and they think it's ending the transaction or and, or releasing the lock. Um, but it doesn't work like that. So if you see release in code, then it's a good chance that the developer uh, was trying to fix a problem and or trying to get over a problem and hadn't done a good job with it. Um, don't use can do. I think that's uh, one that's done to death. But can do. Um, actually can cause some really interesting um, functionality challenges uh, if you make some certain changes. Can do is used for user ver verification uh, and so on within um, user management. It's not, not for looking up whether a string exists in a common delimited list. That's what the lookup function is for. Um, so uh, that's an easy fix. You change can do to lookup and switch the arguments around. And, uh, yes, Vim. Y yeah, but that's the point. <laughs> you, you, you don't have the negation or the, look, the, or the asterisk operator on the lookup is what Vim's saying. Um, uh, yeah, true. But so there's, there, there has to be, you have to find a different way around that one. Can do's bad. <laughs> From a DBA's perspective, anyway, because if you start introducing new fun features in the database, it can break the code um, without anybody realizing. 
So you want to avoid that. And don't use the use index keyword. Um, unless you can actually prove that it's making a difference, and in which case, you should document it within the code as to why you're doing it. Um, Progress knows which indexes to use much better than you do. Um, if you're having to use, it, use index a lot, then actually that probably means that your indexes aren't correct, rather than, um, yeah, rather than actually that, there's, that they actually make a difference. So use index is um, actually, um, it stops bracketing on multiple tables, uh, multiple indexes, sorry. Um, if the indexes change, then it will still continue to use that index, and maybe performance will be worse. Um, so indexes can be changed code, uh, without people ever sort of seeing it, and uh, it can cause problems way down the line. So um, use index is a, is a luxury to use occasionally if it's absolutely necessary, and then document why you've done it in the code so someone doesn't accidentally take it off. And if, you want to, if, you, if you've got a use index because you want your records to come back in a sort no, certain order, then use the by clause on the, uh, on the query. Don't use an index for that. Um, Give your tables and fields and indexes meaningful names. Um, we're hopeless for that one for legacy reasons. All of our indexes are called IDX1, IDX2, IDX3, IDX4, IDX5, etc. Um, my compile listing, oh my, 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 my XREF listing tells me that I'm using IDX5. Well, what does that mean? I have absolutely no idea. I've got to go and look in the data dictionary and find out what uh, fields are on that index. Um, and oh, it's okay, it's those ones. If I'd called it uh, customer order, then it's descriptive. I've got a reasonable idea of what index is being used. Um, and yeah. Um, so, so, and the same with tables and fields. Just give them, give them a good name. Make sure they're you know, understandable, that they do what they say they do. Um, and use the same field name for every value everywhere. So if, if you've got an order number, uh, for a well, customer number is a good one. If you've got a customer number, you, don't have, you, you wouldn't have the um, order customer number, the order, um, I don't know, the, the company customer number, the whatever else. You call it customer number everywhere in the database because then you know that that value is a key field. And they, they, they link to each other. Um, if you start giving things sort of different names everywhere, someone new comes in and looks at the schema, they have no idea that that data is the same in those two places. Um, and if you need a new table field, table or field, don't uh, just add it. Um, don't try and repurpose something else. I see that all too all too often, where someone comes along and thinks, "Ah, I've already got an integer field on this uh, on this table. It's not being used for anything else, so I'll just I'll use it and repurpose it. It doesn't matter that it's called something completely different. Um, I'll just use it." Um, but then further down the line, it becomes complicated, um, and people don't uh, don't know what's going on. These days, with uh, modern versions of versions of Progress, adding stuff to tables, adding fields to tables, um, adding tables, and so on. It's really easy. It can be done online without any um, downtime. Um, you may need to, you know, tell you the clients may need to reconnect or need to refresh their re refresh their connection and that sort of thing. That's you know, but that's that's not difficult to do. You, the database server can do that automatically for you. So there's no reason not to add stuff to the to the to the database. Um, so don't 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 reuse stuff for other reasons, and don't have a generic reference table. Yeah, question. Yeah. 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 <coughs> Correct. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the comment there for the for the recording is that uh, essentially the release does have a, a value for making sure that the that the value that you've got ca in the in the client cache um, is released, so that that buffer is, that buffer is no longer there, so that you don't accidentally find um, duplicate uh, old ver values of of, um, of of fields and or tables or what have you, old values of records and that sort of thing um, w when you refer to them later on because you've accidentally still got the record in the cache. Um, and that's a yeah, it's a very valid point, and that is a good reason. And if you've got that as best practice um, within your application, then that's absolutely fine. That's documented somewhere, as in that's best practice uh, to do that. Um, what I think, what I'm, you know, if you just if you're just throwing them willy nilly in there to because you think it's going to end a transaction, then that's uh, when it's a problem. And, but it's a very valid point. Thank you. Yeah. So don't use a generic reference table. 
Um, uh, you see that quite often that someone creates a, a table which has got a few character fields and integer fields, date fields, decimal fields, and that sort of thing. And it's just a generic sort of table, you know, int field one, int field two, int field three. And then you've got a table code which it refers to. Um, so you've, you might have a three character code for all of your tables. Um, and so you can just find the one that refers to your particular table that you're interested in. And you've got a load of extra fields there that you can use without having to make any database changes and what have you. It's a good idea in, in, in you know, maybe that moment in time, but in practice, uh, it becomes very, very hard to maintain, very hard to understand. People can't look at your schema and say how the data relates to each other. We have this. We use Pro2 replication. We have spent. We have to spend. We've got some bad things like this. We have to spend hours uh, with our SQL guide helping them to understand the data uh, because it, the, the schema doesn't describe itself. Um, and you know, if you imagine coming into a new company and it's you know you've got all things like this and you've you've got the schema in front of you, and it's essentially a one-table database. Um, you know, how are you going to understand how it all relates to each other? Um, so uh, just be careful of of that one. You could use a code quality tool like Cabal to keep on top top of this. Um, um, Gilles Carré, who's uh, um, around wearing one of the blue pug t-shirts, um, he, he's the man to talk to from Riverside Software. Um, but he, uh, it, it basically means that you're not accidentally adding bad practice code into your application. It's a really good way of um, of keeping on on, ta on track with uh, with good code. It helps you to identify what's bad already in your code, but also helps you to identify that what you're adding to the code is bad as well. And you can set up custom rules um, based on how you want to do your coding and everything else. So it's a really good tool, just a little. Um, I think in 12, late 12.2 12 and onwards, I think there's a basic version of it that ships with, um, de with, with the development um, system and everything else. So you can get that up and running with some very simple rules very, very quickly and for free, uh, what's included. <laughs> um, uh, um, but you can, if you want to talk to uh, Gilles, um, he will help you to set it up with much more complex rules um, and that sort of thing at a, at a cost. Um, so that, yeah. No undo. Um, this is one that really does does make DBAs unhappy when it's not there. Basically, no. If you don't put your no undo uh, on your fields and t temp table definitions then the client has to keep track of the values of all of those variables, all those temp tables, and everything else for the whole of the life of that client until it's finished. And then, it's, uh, and then yeah, in case that something happens, it needs to roll back those values. Um, there's very, very few cases where actually a client would need to do that with variables and temp tables, because by very, by very definition, most of the time, we don't really care what the values are, because we're making sure that they've got the right values in them when we, when we use them. Um, the client runs much more slowly because it has to use a lot more memory. Um, and if it's using all of its available cache, it has to flash it out to disk. Um, and uh, that's even slower. So um, yeah, put a no undo on everything that you define, unless there's a reason not to, in which case document it. Just a, just a comment, slash, slash, I really need this because, et cetera. Um, um, and, then, and then someone else comes along and doesn't accidentally whack the no undo on there and everything breaks. Um, so that's just helping each other to write better code. But yeah, from a, from, a, from a database performance or application performance perspective, no undo, uh, not having a no undo can make a big impact. Locking statements. Always use no lock or exclusive lock on your um, finds and for eaches uh, and for lasts and for firsts and everything else. Always specify no lock. Um, there's rare cases where a share lock is necessary. There are good cases for it, but they're quite rare. And if you do use a share lock, Define obviously you, use, you define it as a share lock, but also again document it so that someone comes along and thinks, why the hell's that there, and changes it to an exclusive lock, and then everything stops working. That's yeah, it surely goes without saying. But yeah, just make sure you've got a comment there. But never miss the locking statement. There are database startup parameters um, um, that say um, you know we want to default to a no lock for all queries unless it specifically says um, that we want to have an exclusive lock. Um, but don't rely on that. The DBA might think, well, we don't need that anymore, and takes it off, and suddenly everything's being share locked unnecessarily, and everyone's got locking each other out and blocking each other's sessions, and um, suddenly every performance goes to hell. And um, um, you know, at the same time, the DP as DBAs in here, you know, the, the defaulting to no lock is a great parameter to have on, particularly in a test environment. Stick it on and see what breaks, um, because um, you know, you'll, you'll be it's a great way of finding 
places where people have accidentally forgotten to put a, an exclusive lock on the query. Um, so yeah, don't put it on in live because you'll find that things go wrong very quickly. Um, but share locks in general are really bad news for the database. Um, you, it's very easy to get uh, clients locking each other out and deadlocks and so on. Um, so only use share locks if you need to and document it. OK, the solution to using the release to get rid of transaction scope is to use strongly scoped transactions. Because long transactions or bad transactions, um, bleeding scope of transactions and everything else leads to all sorts of problems like blocked clients. So another client comes along and needs a record to update, and it can't because it's locked by somebody else. Um, BI growth. So the BI file is um, essentially for crash recovery. If the database crashes, it allows the database to um, replay everything that's happened. Um, within all the active transactions to make sure that nothing is lost and roll, it rolls back in flight transactions when the database crashes and everything else. It's, it's very clever. Um, but of course, if you've got long transactions, then that file has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. We had a long running transaction overnight, Monday to uh, Tuesday to Wednesday. And our um, BI file went from the normal gigabyte, I think, that it sort of sits at normally. I think it's about three gigabytes it sits at normally. And overnight, it went up to something like 100 gigabytes because someone had left a transaction open overnight by accident. Um, that's a lot of disk to have to have available suddenly without, you know, and if you can run out of disk pretty quickly. Um, if that had been running for another 24 hours, we would have been up to multiple hundreds of gigabytes of BI file. And um, yeah, that could have been problematic. And also, the BI has to be backed up every time the backup happens. And, that's, and it temporarily pauses the database whilst the, the BI file is being backed up. And if the BI file is massive, then you have a longer pause. Um, so that's uh, another thing. And you get lock table overflows. Um, uh, there's um, a session this afternoon that Rob um, from ProTop is doing, Rob from White Star Software, about um, how to do um, data, uh, what's it called? The um, Anyway, there's some, da there's some data that, um, that Progress now writes to a specific log file when certain events happen to help you to identify what's diagnostic stuff. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, and so that's a good way of finding out what lock table overflows or what's causing lock table overflows. But uh, in earlier versions of Progress, it's really hard because you could have one person locking. You've got a lock table of a million records. Someone's locking 999,999 of them. Someone else tries to lock two. Um, and they're the ones that get the uh, errors. They're the ones that get the, the message on the screen. So you get an error to say they, that there's a lock table overflow. But they're the victim. They're not the cause. Um, and finding the cause can be really, really hard sometimes. And lock table, so yeah. So keep your transactions nice and short. Lock as little as possible within your transaction. And, uh, uh, and don't ask the users for input inside a transaction. Because 5 o'clock on Friday, Gene goes in to update a record. And then thinks, oh, it's time for me to go home, and leaves the screen open. Goes home for the weekend. Maybe she's got a week off. And she comes back a week later and uh, sees that it's still there on the screen. And so, ah, oh, yes, of course I want to do that. And then she, yeah. But by that time, the database is crashed, or um, everybody's crossed because they can't do any work, or that sort of thing. So, you know, don't, don't ask for updates inside transactions. It's bad, 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 bad. Um, or anything else that blocks the, um, the, the client from continuing. Let the transaction complete as quickly as possible. <coughs> and use strongly scoped transactions. You might ask what a strongly scoped transaction is. Uh, thankfully, I've got an example. Um, <coughs> a strongly scoped transaction is where we tell OpenEdge uh, which records or which tables we are going to be updating within this transaction. It has, to be on a it has to be on a buffer that is defined within the scope of this program. It has to be a name. You can name the buffer the same as the table. So I could call this buffer order and order line. For clarity, it's easier to show that a buffer is a buffer by giving it some sort of um, tag. That's my opinion. Um, but we're basically saying this transaction block is for the order table and for the order line table. Those are the only records. Those are the only records that I'm going to be um, updating within this transaction. And when you come down here to the end, at that point in, in time, OpenEdge then says, you're finished with those buffers. I'm going to get rid of them. They're no longer available. And you can see here, so I'm doing my for each on the order table. And I'm refining it here on the buffer with a row ID um, with an exclusive lock. I'm, and I'm also updating some order lines here. 
those are the only two tables that I can update within that transaction scope um, because it's strongly scoped. And that transaction, th and those records go out of scope at the end of here. If I try to reference B order or B order line down here, they're no longer in scope. They've gone. Um, and it, we know that at the end of this transaction scope, those records, the locks are released, the transaction's gone away, and everyone carries on as normal. Um, I can't stress enough just how useful strongly scoped transactions are for writing clean code with transactions that don't bleed scope. If I didn't do this with a, with a, with a strongly scoped transaction, and even, even just finding this on here, I could actually reference B order down here and update B order down here, um, and it would still be in scope. The transaction scope would now have bled from this block out to the whole procedure, and now, this, now the transaction scope to the whole procedure. And then if I go off and call other procedures later down the, down the track, um, they're, they're still in, it's still a transaction, and, it's, and the transaction suddenly bleeds maybe even to the whole client session. Um, and you, you have some big, 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 big problems. This prevents transaction bleed, um, and it prevents you from accidentally referencing wrong values that have been updated before. <coughs> Anyone remember Disk Defragmenter in Windows 98, and that sort of thing? I used to love sitting there, set, setting this going and just sort of watching it sort of move everything around and tidy up my disk so that everything was on the inside of the disk so it would be read easier. Um, it, it was very cathartic. I have no idea if it made any difference. I haven't got a clue, but it was very cathartic setting that and running for a few hours on a, on a Friday evening and, uh, you know, get playing, I don't know, Doom or something like that and then uh, <laughs> on another computer and then coming back and seeing everything on red and blue all nicely lined up and so on. The same happens with the database. Um, the database records become frank, for, can become fragmented. Um, and that's when the data um, for a, well, a record is split across multiple blocks within the database. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's the high level. That's what you need to know. Um, and there are causes for that that are the, up to the DBA. You, the DBA has some control over how that sort of thing happens. And there, but there are also code reasons why that happens. And a really good example of that is you create a template record. So you're creating an order. It needs, a, it needs an order number, right? And it needs a customer number. But we don't know anything else about the order at this particular point in time. So we're going to just create a very skeleton order with the customer number, the order number, to commit that to the database and everything. The, the order's there. Then we do some processing, work out some stuff and everything else, and then we create a second transaction where we update that order with all the other details within it. It's, there, there can be business reasons why that, or logic reasons why that might be an attractive thing to do because of what, for whatever reason. Um, but it, in many cases, it re results in fragmentation because when you create the skeleton record or the, the, the basic record, it's only very small. It's only got a little bit of data, a few bytes of data. And so the engine comes along and it finds the first block where it can fit that, um, that record into the, into the database, puts it in a block, and thinks, that's great. We've got, got, it, there's just enough space for that to go into that, into that block. We'll carry on. And then a bit later, you come along and you update that record. And the engine comes along and says, well, I haven't got space in this block anymore. I can't move it from this block. It has to stay in this block. Um, and because otherwise, the row ID will change for the, for the record. Um, so I have to leave it in that, uh, in that block. Um, so the rest of the data is going to have to go over here somewhere where I've got some space for it and put it in a different block. And now, to read that record, you've got to read two blocks in the database, not one. Um, so from a performance pr perspective, it slows things down. Um, it causes all sorts of other problems as well. Um, and ultimately, leads, leads to that table having to be defragmented, which any DBAs in here know it means a dump and load, which means a lot of hard work, which means, yes, Vim. <laughs> type 2 storage makes a difference, but you can still get fragmentation. Because um, so with type 2 storage areas, um, the, each block can only contain records of the same table or the same index. And type 1 storage areas, everything was mixed. So you could have a bit of this, this, this table, a bit of this table, and a bit of that index all in the same block. The type two, it's all split out. Each, once a block has been assigned to a table, it will always have data from that table. But you could still have a situation where that happens. The fragmentation, the risk of fragmentation is reduced, but you can still have a situation where fragmentation happens, and you still get fragmentation within a type two storage area. So yeah, um, but yeah, it's a good, good, good point, Vim. Um, so we don't want that. What are we on? OK. Um, efficient queries. I have done a talk on query tuning in the past. Uh, I'm sure the slides are available. Um, 
but, uh, and we could talk for hours on query tuning. Um, but bad queries, well, we've got ex excessive reads, maybe even from disk, like we saw with my example earlier. Um, and they that can lead to poor performance. Um, and there's some, just some very basic pointers. Um, know your indexes. Um, and so if you see, because you can, using your xrefs that I talk about here, you compile with an xref listing, um, you can see what indexes each query is using. So you can see very quickly at compile time um, whether the code is using suitable indexes or not. Um, but you can also see if there's whole table reads going on as well. So if you see the keyword whole index, in fact, I've got a slide on that. If you see, the, if you see this whole index there on, there on that, then yeah, there you go. There's my IDX3, you see. Um, what, what index is that? I haven't got a clue. Um, but uh, you can see there's a whole index read there. So something is, something is um, that, that whole table will be read every time that query happens. That whole table is going to be read. Um, there may be a reason for that. Um, we have one table which has one record in it. And so it's a whole index read every time it's read. Because we what's the point of having an index on a table with one record in it? Um, it we just say for each system control. You know, we don't, we, there was only one. <laughs> so, uh, so there we go. Um, but um, yeah, so avoid the whole, whole index in the extra file. Um, did I have something else? Oh, yeah. And benchmark your reads with real data. Um, you need, you should, you know, if you've got, if you've got, say, um, if you know you've got 500 customers um, and your query is reading a million customers, then then, then you know you've got a problem. Or if you're, re if you're expecting to have maybe one customer record come back because there's only one that meets your criteria, but you're actually reading a million records, then there's something wrong with your query. So if you do it with, if you do your benchmarking with real data, it doesn't have to be in live, it can be in a test environment, but if it's real data that's there that you're using to benchmark, then you know, then you can have a reasonable idea of what you're expecting to get back and what you're expecting to see. A um, couple of other things. Um, avoid functions on the left of the query. This is just a silly example, but you, you can see here you've got this. When I say on the left of the query, I mean the, where the, the function is on the sort of uh, on the left-hand side of the where clause. So you've got where the string of the cust number number begins one. Silly example. Um, there's actually only one record in the Sports 2000 database that satisfies that uh, that query, um, but you can see here it's read over a thousand records. It's read all the customers essentially. Um, in order just to return that one record to the client. It's a you know, very simple, basic example, but if you can imagine there's a million customers in there, that's a lot of reads that have to be done to just return one record to the client. Uh, and another one which really kills, and it's really easy to see it in my example, um, it's much harder to see it in your code, but uh, avoid unnecessary duplication of, uh, of database activity. Um, so here we, we're doing a an iterating block 10 times, and we're finding the first customer, um, or finding customer number one in, inside the do block. Um, so that means that that record is going to be read 10 times in order to satisfy that logic that's there. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, as I say, it's very easy to see that that's a problem here. Um, it's much harder to spot it, but um, you know, think about it. You know, that that find customer could be done here above the do block, and because we, we, it's, it's always going to be the same one, uh, we don't need to repeat that logic. Uh, nested for each is with the tables in the wrong order. Um, you want to, in your for each is, you want to start with the table that's going to reduce the data set as quickly as possible. Um, so here's an example. Um, we've got, we're looking for order, order line, and item with various criteria here, basically wanting to see all the orders that have, for golf items that have been shipped. And run that on the Sports 2000 database, you get 13 million reads of the order line table. And a good four, four, three and a half, four thousand on order and item. Um, if we, um, where am I? Yeah. There we go. Sorry, it did move forward. Um, if we actually change it and look for the item table first, and then go to the order line and go to the order, it's exactly the same query, but the tables have all been flipped round. You can see we get 235 order lines, 235 orders, and five items. That's uh, much quicker much, much quicker query in this particular case. Um, and these are the sorts of things that, in your code, um, can make a massive difference. Um, I can't remember exactly how what the difference was, but it was something of the order of like 30 seconds for the first query to complete, and instantaneous for the second, uh, instantaneous, milliseconds. Um, 
so it, and it's a very quick and easy way to, um, to, to fix bad performance. And another thing to avoid as well with your queries is having lots of ORs. This is just a very simple example from a long, long time ago. Um, but you know, you could imagine that this, in fact, it does this, this OR statement here. It just goes on and on and on and on because someone, you know, every now and then they wanted to, they were saying, oh, well, let's have it for electricity. Let's have it for water. Let's have it for whatever else, uh, gas. Let's have it for this. Let's have it, you know, just keep, keep adding to it and everything else. And you can see it's reading a lot of, a lot of records, nearly a million reads. Um, of the, in total of those two tables. And actually, if you look at the primary key for product group, it's actually reading the, the primary key twice for each, uh, for each time, for each iteration through the query. So it's pretty poor. Um, we solved that one by creating a temp table with the product groups that we were interested in. And just uh, going for each t product group, t t temp table product group, and then each meter site where it matches. And suddenly we've gone, we've halved the number of meter site reads, and the product group reads has gone down to two. Um, so that made a you know it's a big difference very very quickly. Um, so uh, uh, so it's a, a thing. Anyway, moving on from queries because we could be here all day, and I think we've got about 20 minutes left, so that's about right. Um, database changes. Do try and get it right first time, particularly because schema schema ads are easy even in 11.7. Um, you can add stuff to the database online. Indexes are a little bit more tricky. Um, but um, um, but if you look at um, but even like modern modern versions of uh, modern versions of progress, you can do a lot more stuff online in terms of um, um, uh, changing the schema online and so on. You can drop start, it, there's times where the ability to drop rec drop tables and drop fields and all of that sort of lovely stuff, which is cool. Um, but if you're stuck on a on 12.2 still or on 11.7 or God forbid anything older than that, um, you know making making changes to the schema can be pretty hard. Um, so from a DBA's perspective, if you get it right first time, that makes me happy because I don't have to then go finding downtime in order to make changes to what you've screwed up. Um, and indexes, you'll ask yourself the question, do you need all of them? Um, here's a point here, single field indexes for every field or lots of fields uh, are really poor design. It's much better to have a few compound indexes, so a few indexes with a few fields on. And I know Vim's going to jump in here. Um, <laughs> uh, just a minute, Vim. Um, yeah, it's much better to have a few well-structured indexes on, on a number of fields than it is to have lots and lots and lots of indexes on every field. And if you don't need an index, don't add it. You know, um, yeah, it's OK. I'm not trying to say don't add an index. Um, but um, particularly if you're adding indexes online, Adds of indexes requires activation. There's a couple of gotch gotchas with that, which can um, cause some performance problems whilst that's actually happening as well. Um, but yes, so just you have to always ask yourself the question: Do you actually need those indexes before you add them? Vim. Um, the easiest solution to that is to have a, um, a, a is to just have a generic uh, d d structure where you just have a tables area and an indexes area, and then separate areas for really busy tables and indexes. But that solves the problem. You don't need to worry about rows per block at that point. In most situations, that's actually fine. Um, but yes, it's a good question. And so in the past, in, in previous places where we've been worried about rows. Rows per block, it's, a w it's the way that uh, the data is stored within the database on disk. Um, and if you, um, essentially, uh, what we had to do in a previous place was all database changes, scheme, all database changes which required addition of tables had to come with example data um, from testing. Because you've tested it, right? You've created records in your test system or in your development system once you've been doing the development work. In order for that to get into the production system, I want to see sample data for that table. Um, I want to see, um, you know, I want to know, or I want to be know that there is sufficient sample data in my test environment, which means I can then go and analyze that data and see where I should put that in the production database. And then when we refresh um, uh, test from production, that those changes then filter back down into the development and test and everything else. Um, so that's because that everybody tests their code, right? <laughs> I hope so. And you're not testing in production. <laughs> Good question, Vim. Uh, 
and also add things when they're needed and not before they're needed. I mean, you know, obviously, if you've got a release cycle and you know, and things you need, you need stuff in there, then that's that's fine. But what I'm, you know, if you start a project and um, you know you're not going to finish it until next year, um, don't add those tables into the database now. Wait until they're actually needed with the when the code goes gets released. Um, it keeps things tidy because we all know projects go away um, or business requirements change. And you've suddenly got a load of stuff in the database which you don't need anymore. And it's just taking up space and taking up management. We've got tables in our database that have got no records in. I don't know why that is. Um, but it's because someone's made poor decisions in the past about priorities, um, added stuff to the database, and then the project's gone away. And nobody's bothered to tidy up behind themselves. Um, we still have to maintain those tables in the database, even if they're empty. We still have to make sure that they're you know, behaving themselves, as it were, or would behave themselves if they ever were to be used. That's a lot of extra work for me as a DBA. And empty, empty fields in a, in a table, empty fields in a the table, they, they um, bloat the database, they bloat the buffer cache. So the, the, bu the, the buffer cache is a fixed length of blocks. It's, it can't get any bigger. You tell it what size. When you start the database, you say, this is how much memory I want to allocate to the cache. And if you're putting records into that uh, cache that have got empty fields in, which are never used, they still take up some space within the buffer cache, right? Um, so you've got these wide fields that are actually narrow in terms of the data that they contain. So they, they, they cause bloat, and it means you've got less in, the, in memory. So again, if, you don't, if you're going to add fields to the database, put them in there when you need them, not before, in case they never get used. Uh, come on. There we go. I think it's caught up again. There we go. So lobs or long objects, binary data in your database. Please don't. <laughs> there are good reasons sometimes, um, but they do cause problems. Y you need to have a plan for them, for starters. Um, they can bloat the database really, really quickly. I, yeah, PDF, PDF documents, Word documents, and that sort of thing. They can uh, they can really make the database bloat very very quickly because they're not compressed files or well, not normally for compressed files. PDFs are compressed to a point, but if you've got images in your PDF document, then those are all in there as well, and they can bloat things very very quickly. What about say you say if you're keeping track of uh, API calls and you want to keep a record of all the XML that's come back from all these API calls, you think ah oh, it's a good idea. We'll store them in the database. We can refer back to them at the at a future date. Sounds like a good time at design time. The DBA will go, is going to kill you because suddenly he's got to maintain all of these documents within the database. The database is a data store. It's not a document store. There's fi file storage. It's called file storage for a reason. There are various ways you can do it. You can use Amazon buckets or, um, or a folder on disk. Um, but they make jo maintenance jobs really hard. Every backup has got to have all of those documents backed up within it. Um, and there's um, very few cases where the database is a better place. We had a situation um, where we had, a, in a previous job, we had, a, I think it was a four or 500 gigabyte database. And two thirds of that was files that have been stored in the database, PDF documents stored in the database. And someone thought it was a good idea because we want to control who has access to those documents, right? Um, it's, a, you know, it's a great, the database has user management and everything else. We know exactly who's got the rights to get to those because we control that through the code and everything else, nobody can get to those because they're encapsulated within the database. It was a good idea, or they thought so, but suddenly we've got 300 gigabytes of documents sitting in the database that I've now got to maintain as the DBA. Every time I do a backup, those 300 gigabytes have to be backed up. If I want to do a dump and load, those 300 gigabytes have to be dumped and loaded. If I want to restructure the database or, or Take a back, move a backup onto a, onto another server for you know to test. Well, that's an extra three hours of copying stuff across the network, um, and it gets a problem very very quickly. We actually solved that problem by creating a, f a separate file server, uh, which had really strict access rights. Essentially, admins and one user, and that one user was called App Server, um, and only the App Server could actually access that file that file system, and no users could. And we created an App Server process which would um, go off if you wanted. If someone wanted to fetch a document to see, the app server process would go off to the file store, would find the document, retrieve it, show it to the user on the screen, and then it would be gone again um, once they were finished. And the file system's great for that because the file system can be snapshotted. It can snapshot that as much as you like. 
Um, you can have it backed up every five minutes for all I care. Um, whereas in the database, that makes life a lot, a lot harder to, to, to do and that sort of thing. So yeah, there's, there's ways around it. Um, yeah, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, and you need to have a data retention plan. This goes for LOBS or any other data. We don't need all the data all the time, do we? I don't know. I mean, there are business reasons why you would. Auditing purposes, you may need to keep stuff for seven years for the tax office, maybe. Um, you may need to, there may be best practice reasons why you want to keep some data. Um, but, you know, if you don't need to retain it forever, then why not get rid of it? Because it's just bloating the database. Like with our stock, uh, you know, one of the things that we're doing with stock is we're going to look at a way of archiving old stock so it's no longer in the database. It will improve performance. Well, it will be in the database, but it will be in an archive table, which means we're never going to read it when we do our stock loads. Um, we don't need the stock there. We might need it maybe once in a blue moon when we're doing historic reporting and that sort of thing. But that's, you know, we don't really need it active in an active table um, and so on. So have a plan. Work, it, work out you know, how you're going to archive or purge that data. Um, that's a business decision. You have to talk to the business, uh, which is a good practice anyway. It's, it's useful to talk to the business from time to time because they actually have some good ideas sometimes. They might be a pain in the ass, but uh, <laughs> also <laughs> they have some good ideas too. But talk to them. Say, look, are we wanna, do, do we want to really need to keep all this data? Do we actually want to keep that, that data with five billion rows in it, or can we maybe chop it down a bit? And if you're using things like products like auditing, for example, and depending on your open edge release, it, there's better ways of doing a purge than just doing a for each delete. So with auditing, there is a there's a an, an option to purge the, the table, and it's like that. It just drops the data. It's a bit like a truncate on, in SQL, in the sense of you just say truncate the table and the data's gone. Um, whereas in a for each delete, obviously, as a big transaction locks a lot of records, slows everything down. So it's just something to bear in mind with uh, you know with that. There may be better options. Um, and just because you can, um, well, there's, there are certain things that you can do that you shouldn't do. Um, so don't use the rec ID um, anymore. Um, rec ID has gone away. Um, it's rec IDs are no longer guaranteed to be unique within the database because if you're using something like table partitioning, for example, the same rec ID could exist in two different partitions. Possibly, it doesn't isn't guaranteed, but it's possible. Um, Row ID, though, is unique within the database. So a row ID is a, def is a guaranteed way to find the record that you want. But don't store row IDs in the database. Please don't store row IDs in the database, because if anybody makes any changes to the structure of the database, maybe doing a table move or something like that to restructure the database, those row IDs change because they, are, they contain a reference to the storage area and the location on the disk that that record is in. So if someone does a dump and load or a table move or something like that, the row ID changes. And those raw IDs stored in the database now are wrong, and you're not going to find the records anymore. You have to refresh them or whatever, and uh, it cause a massive problem. Um, don't use array fields, and then you know unless you really have to, but then don't don't do it anyway. Arrays are really bad, particularly in the database. They're not so bad in code, um, but in the database, arrays are really horrible. The biggest problem with an array field, if you've got an extent of say 10 and suddenly you realize actually you need to have 11 values in there, just make a database change to change the extent value to 11. It's simple, right? No, it wipes all the data in that, uh, in that array. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a nightmare. You know, you then you have to make a program to you know, dump all the data, ch change the schema, load the data back in again to maintain the integrity of the data. Um, so yeah, don't, don't use arrays. Uh, and they, they to coding around them for all sorts of things. Anything that you want to do that's dynamic and, and having to code around the fact that there might be extents just makes things really complicated and difficult. So don't, don't use them. And don't put business logic into the schema. A good example of that is the, I think it was like a V6 um, feature of being able to put a validation statement um, within the database to validate your data. I don't think m people use it, but there, are, I, I, there have been some examples where people do use that sort of thing, where the, the business logic to validate within the actual database schema. 
if you ever have the option of you doing that, don't, because it's impossible to find out what's going on. You get messages and functionality that you can't track down because it's held within the schema, not within the code. Um, so, yeah, Marianne. What do you what mean? Yeah, yeah, so the question is about the foreign key constraint and maintaining relations and so on. Um, yeah, progress doesn't do foreign keys, does it really? Um, it doesn't. Um, and that's something that, because we define foreign keys in the code, not in the database. Um, uh, yeah. Nobody asking about foreign key. Nobody even bother about the foreign key. Yeah, yeah. Well, but it can, yeah. yeah. It's, I, I do think that those belong to the schema because it's really yeah, yeah they, they do a SQL, right? right? But it belongs to the schema. So yeah, it does a SQL, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not, not. It's not. In some it's not business logic. logic. It's database definition. Data 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 so on. progress is very agnostic, agnostic about foreign keys. keys. So, so yeah, yeah, we will. I mean, data corruption and that kind of thing that we get most of the time in progress. Yeah. yeah. Because triggers that didn't fire and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's all sorts of all sorts of issues there, man. Absolutely. Um, but uh, we we work with the tools we've got. <laughs> um, and on that note, know your tools. Um, the uh, things like the debugger, the profiler, how to get your CRUD stats, create, read, update, delete stats, how to find that um, for your queries, um, how the log entry types work. There's all sorts of documentation and presentations on all of these, but know know how they work as a developer because if you if you know how they work and you're using them, um, then you're going to be writing better code and I'm going to be happier because I'm not having to solve so many problems because you've written good code. It's much easier to fix code at the time of writing it than it is to fix code a year later when the person has gone on long-term sick who wrote it and, and three other people have had their fingers in it as well. Um, so, yeah. And a little bonus tip before we finish. Um, I know nearly up on time, but um, attend DBA sessions at the pugs. You might not be DBAs, um, but attending uh, sessions about DBA stuff can help you understand how the database works. It can help you understand the pain that we go through sometimes on, your <laughs> on the behalf of developers. Because a lot of it's, I think a lot of it's hidden as well, that, that, that of the stuff that goes on, because there isn't sort of that much, so much cross-pollination. A lot of organizations don't have DBAs because the progress database just runs, um, or they outsource it to someone else. So attend those sessions, but also, um, there's a lot of background on stuff I've talked about, but actually um, you understand how the database works and it will help you. For example, temp table storage locally on disk uh, or in memory function, functions very in a very similar way to database tables, the way they're stored on disk on the database side. Um, and understanding how you can tune your temp tables on the client side, for example, um, can improve the performance of your code. And actually knowing how much memory is being used by temp tables and knowing um, where it's being, where the, where the temp files are being stored, ha and suddenly realizing that actually this client is using a heck of a lot of disk because your temp table is massive and it doesn't fit in memory anymore, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's it, it, it's the same problems that we have from the on the database side, but it's been moved to the client. So uh, so that's the sort of thing that you can uh, that you can have a, a lot of information about. So yeah, I'd encourage you if you see DBA talks that look like they might be relatively on the basic side, so performance improvement stuff and that sort of thing. Great way to get to, good, good, good ones to get to and, uh, and have a sit in um, if you can. So yeah, I think I've got maybe two minutes for questions, but also I'm available um, around if you've got any questions. Um, so yeah. Okay, well either, either you're all ready to go and make your DBAs happy or you've put you to sleep, one of the two, so uh, yeah, that's good. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening. Thank you.